Again, we thank you so much for joining us at the Touching Hearts Ministries Church. We know that you're going to be blessed today. We're going to talk about a subject, the love of God. Now, we've been covering, if you've been watching our programs, either on our website or YouTube or our DVDs, you found out we've been talking about justification. We've been talking about salvation. And in a few weeks, we're going to go on to the subject of sanctification, something that's rarely even spoken of from the pulpit, but which is of the utmost importance. But today we're going to talk about the love of God, and I know that you're going to be blessed. You're going to find out that no matter how much you fail God this week, and it seems like we all do that from time to time, that God still loves you and wants to forgive you. But as always at our church, before we go into our service, we always ask that the Holy Spirit come and guide us and direct us, and may the Spirit do the talking. And everybody said amen on that. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father. I thank you for the privilege of preaching the gospel of Christ. And, oh God, you've let me be able to preach your love and your grace going on 16 years. And I can't believe the time has gone by that quickly. But I thank you for calling me into the ministry. Now that Jesus has become my best friend, I pray that I can share that <clears throat> with others. So, Father, would you bless this message today? Guide the words that are spoken. My desire is to uplift the lovely name of Jesus Christ. And reveal the true character of the Heavenly Father. So Lord through the Spirit today. And his words. May someone be touched and drawn closer to thee. In the name of Jesus. Not just my creator. But my best friend. Thank you Father. <clears throat> Our scripture today. And we've read the scripture. And you've heard it. Over and over again. But we're going to read it again. I'm going to base this sermon upon the scripture today. And you'll find that in John 3.16. Here's what the Bible says. It's not what Donnie Shelton says. This is what the Bible says. For God so loved. I want you to keep that in mind today. For God so loved the world. What's the world? Does He love the dirt? He loves the people. That is the world. God so loved the people of the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus, that whosoever would turn to Him and repent and give their lives to Jesus Christ and believe upon Him that they will not perish, but they will have everlasting life. Now, we're all going to die. I mean, man, it's sentenced. You were born, you're going to die eventually. But you will not perish in the fact that Jesus Christ will bring you back to life and you will live eternity with Jesus Christ. And here's what the Bible says in verse 17. Which sometimes we overlook, Carolyn. God sent is not His Son into the world, not to condemn the people, but that through Him we might be saved. And everybody said, Amen. He came to condemn sin. We talked about that last week. But there's a few things that's been on my mind lately, Susan. I'm just going to read outright to you. In fact, I'm actually just going to read it. This was my thoughts this week. I sometimes wonder, what was going through the mind of God? What were some of the emotions as He watched His Son Jesus? Suffer not only the cross, but how he suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. What was going through God's mind? Those two holy beings, we're talking about God and his son. Those two holy beings who had shared their presence and love with one another from eternity to eternity. How long is that? Forever. Now, listen to this. God the Father, in his great love for mankind, had to hold his hand of judgment as he watched his son fall to the ground in the garden because Jesus felt the separation from the Father because of man's transgressions. You've got to think about this. This was the first time from eternity to eternity that Jesus had felt separation from the Holy Father. First time he had felt separation from the love of his Father. The story of Jesus. Jesus felt by sin, listen, He was being separated from His Father. Yet because of Jesus' love for each precious soul, He accepted death, and in death He gave His life for mankind. Let me go on and read to you this. This is what was going through my mind this week, Blake. Imagine this. Having all the power to change any circumstance, any situation by thought or words or by power. But because of your great love to save the world, 
who has rebelled against you, you hold back the power to save your own son who is innocent and precious and loving. As God looked down from heaven at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the pain and the suffering he went through, God could have changed Bobby Joe that moment. He could have changed that circumstance. He could have raised his son to full power. But because of his great love for us, he allowed his son to be persecuted and crucified because of his great love for us. But Christ, listen to this, but Christ, love compelled Jesus to raise himself up off his knees in the garden. Christ's love for us enabled him to make the journey up Calvary Hill. Christ's love empowered him to hang upon the cross in indescribable pain. I'm just trying to give you the, the basis and the thesis of our sermon today. Because Jesus Christ fell to the ground, because of the incredible weight of the sins of the world, because of His great love for us, it enabled Him to rise up off the ground and walk up Calvary's hill for us. Now again, I'll say it one more time. Because of His great love for us. Is everybody with me so far? Listen to this. Christ's love for man breathed out the words, Father, forgive them, because these people are totally unaware that they have nailed the Son of God to the cross. And Jesus Christ said, forgive them. Now let me go on and read. And it was love that permeated the body of God that allowed His Son to be tortured and beaten and crucified by the hands of the angry, demon-possessed mom. In the story of Jesus, Ellen G. White writes this. God saves man through the blood of Jesus Christ alone. And man's belief in and allegiance to that Jesus is our salvation. Those, here's, I'll, if you don't get anything else from the sermon today, Susan, other than this. Those who will be saved in the kingdom of God will be those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of Jesus Christ. The plan of salvation, she said, listen to this is just too high to be reached by human thought. The plan of salvation and the love behind the plan of salvation is just too much for me to comprehend. So you know what I do? I accept it by faith. Come on, somebody's been amen. The whole thesis, the whole foundation of the sermon today is a love that we're not able to understand, but by faith we accept it. And everybody said, Amen. All right, let's go on to the sermon today. Romans, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave Jesus Christ, that whosoever believes in Him should, listen, experience eternal life. God kindly and lovingly gave the world His heart. The world in return, with malice and hate, took the heart of God and hung it upon a wooden cross. We're talking about Jesus today. And I've said this over and over again, C.J., that God hung His own heart upon the cross in His great love for mankind. Jesus, listen, God kindly and lovingly gave the world His heart. And yet the world was full of malice. What is malice? We'll find out today. Malice is the desire to inflict harm and suffering upon one another. The personality and the character of the world today, and we talked about Samson being in the world today, this is the character of the world today. The personality of the world today has been transformed into the character of the devil who with malice and hatred entered those who screamed, let his blood be upon us and our children. And the mobs cry, crucify, crucify him. Love in human form was nailed to an old wooden cross. And you'll find that in Matthew 27, 22. Matthew 27, 22 to 25. Here's what the Bible says. This is the teaching sermon today. Listen to this. Pilate said to the angry mob, What shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And Pilate went on to say, What evil hath Jesus done? And the mob cried even louder, and all the more, Crucify him till death. And in verse 25, here's what the people cried. Let his blood be upon us, and our children, we take full responsibility for this action. 
for we know what we are doing. I dare this man to claim to be the son of the living God. And the spirit of prophecy says this. This angry mob gone insane could not answer Pilate for the only valid answer was Jesus had done no wrong. But what the mob lacked in logic they made up in wild clamor like a pack of wolves she said they howled even the more crucify him crucify him and crucify him. Yet out of love we're going to go right back to it over and over again Robert Dean today yet out of love that is impossible for us to understand, God allowed His Son to be nailed to an old wooden cross. And even, the Spirit of Prophecy says, while our Lord hung in agony, in pain beyond comprehension, Jesus said, O Father, forgive these people, for these are the very ones that I came to die for. Come on. <laughs> Jesus looked down and said, O God, have mercy upon these, because these are the very ones that I came to die for. It was your sins, Susie and Crystal, that nailed Jesus to the cross. It was my sins that nailed Jesus to the cross. He said, oh God, hold your hand back of judgment. These are the very ones that I came to die for. And I came to die for them, Blake, because of my great love for them. And it goes on to say, if you'll read here, Jesus denounced hypocrisy. He denounced unbelief. And He denounced sin. But tears, the Bible says, were in his voice as he uttered scathing rebukes to the lost. The spirit of prophecy says that Jesus wept over Jerusalem, the city that he loved because they refused to accept him. One of the most damning things that I have ever listened to that is being taught in our churches today that has pushed more people away from God is the fact that God burns you forever. Now, I talked about this a few months ago, but I'm hearing this, Jen. i I, I gotta, I got to rebuke this. I'm hearing this on the radio in supposedly religious churches over and over again that God will burn you forever. That the moment, Susie, that you die, listen, you will go to hell and you burn in a fire forever and ever. i got to rebuke this. That's the reason I'm going to bring this out again today. I know you've heard it, and I know in the Adventist movement and different movements, that we know better than that, that once you die, you're gone forever. You don't burn forever and ever. But this right here, I've even got one brother that says, how could a God that loves you burn you forever and ever and ever? So we have to rebuke that. Is anybody with me? I told you you have to stand up for what's truth. Most churches in the world today teach you burn forever and ever and ever that God who loves you with all of His heart watches you writhe in pain does that even make sense? As Judge Judy says, if it doesn't make sense, it's a lie. Come on. Now, so we're going to rebuke that right now. And I have to do that. I've been hearing this on the radio, Brenda, so much. I cannot believe it. And it's supposedly intelligent people that are teaching this today. They appear normal. They're teaching that God that loves you with an everlasting love, as it says in Jeremiah 331, that He loves you with an everlasting love, yet He watches you writhe forever in fire forever and ever. It cannot be. And we're going to prove that by what the Bible says today. Let's go a bit further. Now, yet most of the world, listen to this, believes that Jesus, the representative of God, who was God in the flesh, can watch the very ones that He died for Live in agony and eternal fire forever and ever and ever. It doesn't make sense. Listen to this, what the Bible says. Jesus wept for the, His children. He prayed for His children. He healed them. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. He preached mercy and grace. And He loved His Father. Yet you're telling me today that He will watch those precious folks burn forever and ever and ever. Folks, it doesn't make sense and we're going to prove that today by what the bible says here's what one writer says and she's my favorite writer ellen g white she writes this concerning the divinity of christ christ was god essentially and in the highest sense even when he assumed humanity he did not cease to be god he loved you as god because he was god 
The very God that loves you not only prayed for them and healed them, He wept for them. Come on. This is God in the flesh. So when I talk about Jesus weeping, I see God weeping. They were as one. We're going to find that. Here's what it says in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. And I can't believe we have to preach this sermon again, but I've heard this on the radio over and over, and I'm going to rebuke it today. Here's what the Bible says. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, many different manners, spake in times past unto the Father by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us, the world, by His Son. And His Son, listen to what it says about Jesus, Susan, who being the brightness of God's glory. You know what the glory is? Character. Jesus being the brightness of His glory or God's character and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, washed them away by his own blood, sat down by the right hand of God. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible teaches. Father and the Son are inseparable. Christ did not become the brightness of God's glory. He already was the brightness of God's glory. And he has always been. Express image. Let's go over this one more time for those that are viewing in. Express image. What does that mean? Christ is the exact counterpart of God. When Christ said He is the express image of the Father, it means that it was more than just the inward. It was in the outward expression as well. And I love what the Spirit of Prophecy says here, Carolyn. Listen to this. Jesus is the exact and true expression of of the very innermost nature of God, as is the Father. So is the Son, one in essence, one in character, one in mind, one in purpose. When Jesus said to Philip, you, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father, He was literally saying, when you're looking at me, you're looking to the eyes of God. And I love you, and God loves you, and the Holy Spirit loves you. We have one church out there today that's teaching that the Holy Spirit is not part of the Godhead. <laughs> it's not part of the Trinity. We have so many untruths that are going on in the churches today. We have to deal with them. We talked about that this morning in our, our Sabbath school. Let's go a bit further now. What is God's purpose? What is the Son's purpose because of love today? What is their purpose? Their purpose is to save mankind, not burn them forever. Come on. Even at the expense of the death of the Son of God, the Creator of all things, a God had to die upon the cross to save mankind. As Adrian Rogers said, when Jesus' blood dripped from the cross, it was the blood of a God that was dripping. We have to look at Jesus a little bit differently today. Now, let's go a bit further. One author put this this way. When Jesus came to the earth, he laid aside his royal robe. He put down, the listen, the crown upon his head. And Jesus, because of his great love, chose to step down from the universe, no, the throne of the universe. The Lord our God, the spirit of prophecy says, is one God. Christ and the Father of one. They share the throne of the universe. Thus, she said, the plan of salvation, the life of Christ on this earth, His sacrifice on the cross, His death, His resurrection, were with accord with one another. How many of you have heard that when man sins, Jesus goes before God and says, Oh God, please have mercy. Remember the blood like, like He has to save us. They're in one accord. <laughs> they're not against each other. They're of one purpose. They're of one God. They're of one thought. They're of one purpose to save mankind. Listen to this. They are in accord with one another. Both love. Both desire. Both suffer. Both in mind and emotion and in thought. When Christ was on the cross, God had to turn and look away. It was more than He could bear. Can somebody give me an amen on that? Let me give you a perfect example. Brenda and I have 10 grandchildren. We got one on the way. <laughs> We're going to have 11. 
when one of those grandchildren come to me, and they always go to Poppy when they're hurt, when they're injured, sometimes they'll come up and they got a little tiny boo-boo. It's so tiny i got to get my glasses to find it. They're in pain. The tears and the snot are flowing. And I look at it now to, I don't want to hurt the fittings. I'll say, Brenda, get the surgery kit out. we got a gaping wound here. This baby's hurt. And she'll run and we'll get a Band-Aid. We don't know what we're covering up. We don't see anything. But I actually do, Carolyn. I hurt for that baby. I really do. That baby's in tears. How could I ever as a human being, burn that baby forever. Come on. With my human emotions, my carnal nature, I wouldn't hurt that baby for a trillion dollars. Come on. But you're telling me, a God of spirit, a God of love that created me, if I turn against Him, is going to burn me forever. Come on. Does that make any sense to you? <laughs> wow. But it is taught with authority, you die tonight and you will burn in hell forever. Brenda and I went to a church a few years ago and I want to tell you where we was at. I went because my friend was a pastor there. And we went one night. And we sat there. And he came out and said it. If one of you in this room here die tonight and you're not saved, you're going to go and you're going to burn forever and ever and ever. People were running to the front like that, that out of fear. You can't serve God out of fear, folks. And by the way, that was a lie from the pits of hell. That was a lie. When you die, you will wait for the judgment. Is anybody with me? And then after the judgment, if you don't know Jesus, you're just gone forever. You're gone forever from the presence of the Holy Father. Isn't that bad enough? All right, let's go a little bit further. Now, so how could God, how could Jesus, who with tears in his voice rebuked the people that he tensely loved, how could this God punish anyone with eternal fire? Now, here's how the Bible will explain this to you folks. And those that are viewing in, you, you probably need to write these scriptures down. After we go off the air today, you probably need to study these for yourselves. Here's what the Bible says in Matthew 3.12. John the Baptist said, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, talking about Christ. He will gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. You know, when I was in India, over there for those three weeks, and if you don't, we were over there for three weeks a few years ago, uh, Molly Stinson and Ronnie Shelton and I and a few others were over there preaching the gospel to five and 6,000 people every night. But over in India, the part that we were in and all the different huts, it was as if I was watching people live like they did 2,000 years ago. And they would take different grains and they would put them out in the road. These roads. And the oxen and the wagons would run over these grains. And what they would do after they would run over them, they would take a whole handful of the grain and the shaft that was around the grain and throw them in the air. And the shaft would blow away and only the grain would fall. That's how they separated. But they would take, when they got a big bundle of this shaft, and they would just burn it up. It would be gone forever. When Jesus comes and you're not, in the, you're not going to be in the kingdom, He comes in all of His glory, you're going to be consumed if you're not saved, you're not washing the blood, and you're going to be gone forever. He says the shaft is burned up. Is anybody with me? Let's go a bit further. We're going to clear that up a little bit deeper as we go today. John, listen, to, you know what John was referring to Malachi 4, which said in that great day, the wicked will be burned up so completely at the arrival of God in all of His glory, consumed, they will be burned up so quickly and completely that neither root nor branch remain. It's almost like you're saying, if you burn forever, that the roots remain. and you're going to, The Bible says they burned up and they're gone forever. And ever and ever and ever. It's gone. All right, let's go a bit further. Now, unquenchable. What does that mean? When it says unquenchable fire. Fire will not be extinguished until they have burned up the last sieges of sin. When everything is gone in this new earth, the old earth's burned up. That's what the Bible says. We get a brand new earth, brand new heavens. It's consumed. It's gone. It's all, all sin is gone forever and ever. Listen to this. Here's what Pastor Arthur Chambers wrote. And I love him. 
Those who want to believe in the doctrine of eternal torment have failed to look fairly into the matter. You know what I said? They haven't looked into the matter. If they actually believe that you burn forever and ever and ever. Listen to this. He went on to say, the idea of eternal burning hell is completely foreign to the Scriptures. It's just not taught. <laughs> I like that. Now, the Greek word for fire used in Matthew 25 is aeonis, which means a terminable period. That ex Listen, that everlasting fire known as a noise, it means a period which will pass away. Hear what I just said. When they put eternal fire in that Scripture, it means it's a period that will pass away, not go on and on and on. Come on, somebody help me. When you're studying Scriptures, you have to go into the Hebrew. You've got to go into the Greek. Is that right? Yeah, that's what you have to do. You can't just look at it and say, oh, that's it. There are reasons they put these words Sometimes in the Latin, sometimes in the Greek, sometimes in the Hebrew. So we find out that everlasting fire means a period that will pass. Now, one mind man writes this. The presumption of God's character that He will sit upon His throne and watch the very ones that Jesus died for, that this God will watch them suffer torment and anguish and pain in a fire that will go on and on has drawn millions away from God. That's, that's the devil's trick. Because, I got a brother that believes that, because of this untruth that's taught in the churches today, that you will burn forever and ever, it has turned him off. He said, I will not serve a God that will watch somebody burn forever and ever and ever. Come on, somebody help me. Now listen to this. All oh, the lies, the spirit of prophecy says, of Satan. But because men has drifted so far from the truth, sin has become their choice of many, and the deceptions of the devil are accepted as if it is truth. There's what it says in Malachi 4.1. Here's what the Bible says. For, the, for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, and yes, those that did wickedly, shall be stubble in that day, and they shall be burned up, saith the Lord of the host. There will be no root nor branch. Verse 3 says, listen, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes, thank you, Brenda, under the soles of your feet in that day that I will do this. Listen to this. Conception of eternal fire is an untruth that is totally against the loving and kind God that we know and love, she said. But listen, the old devil lies are continuing to be accepted. Reading this scripture, I want to read this to you. And studying the scripture certainly affects our depiction of God. In the eyes of many, this exacting God who looks for mistakes and opportunities to bring judgment upon those terrible sinners has a right to torture these poor souls because it he is God when we say that God can torture because he's God it lowers my estimation of the loveliness of God can tell me what I just said by the very fact I said you know what God can do it he's God he can burn him if he wants to that lowers my depiction of his lovely character of who and what he is I'm saying this crystal I wouldn't burn some <laughs> I wouldn't burn anybody forever even for a second so I think my, my character is better than God's because he could. Come on, you remember what I just said? I, as a human being, wouldn't stick a match to anybody. But God does, so I have a better character than he does. That's what I'm saying when I say God burns somebody forever and ever and ever. You hear what I just said? Let's go a bit further now. Now, this is something I'm trying to clear up today. I'm trying to throw this in as we go because I've heard that over and over this week that I'm not able to bear it anymore, CJ. So I want to address that today. Now listen to this. I, I just give you the example of Brenda and I. Now listen to this. Spirit of prophecy says Jesus always spoke the truth, but always in love. He never, ever was rude. He was full of love and mercy and compassion, and love and mercy and compassion were revealed in every act of his life. His heart went out in sympathy 
to those who rejected him. You hear what I just said? Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord hath appeared of old, saying unto me, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you unto me. You know what infinite means? Infinite love? It is great beyond measure. There are no limits to God's love, Blake. And I love this. It is real. It is pure. It is holy. And the best part is this. God's love cannot change under any circumstance. Isn't it somehow we just love somebody one day and we can't bear them the next? You just love them, they're good to us, and they send one word out of the way. And I say, I can't take that guy. That's how we are. We're up and we're down. God never changes. Let's go on. And I love this. Listen to this right here. Romans 8, 38 says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor death nor any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God. You know what? I'm going to break that down for you. I'm in a hurry because i got a lot to say. I'm going to break it down for you. Death cannot separate or cease to take God's love away from me, Blake. Thank you. Nothing in this life. Now, CJ, you talked about that today. Thank you. Nothing in this life. Man's failures, man's defeats, man's faults, man's rejection, man's filth of sin. Nothing can overpower God's love for us. The love of God, listen to this, that he has for his angels does not supersede or diminish his love for me. Principalities, what does that mean? No nation or country, or any power on this, listen, on this earth, or in the universe, can overwhelm God's love for His people. The vastness of the cosmos, let's make it even deeper here, Jan. The vastness of the cosmos, in its depth, nor any creature in the universe, whether it be known to me or alien to me, can divert or alter in any way the unconditional, the undying love that dwells and lives in the heart of God for me. <laughs> wow, that's getting big, ain't it? Jeremiah said that God's love is everlasting. What does that mean? It means it is forever. It is eternal. And I love this part right here, Dad. Listen. Whether God is loved or accepted or rejected, His love never changes. His love is unshakable. It is immovable. It is 100% pure love, undiluted with carnal nature, strictly spiritual, a love without end, and a world without end, full of love from the Heavenly Father. Wow, it didn't get any better than that. Man, if I can experience five minutes of love, I feel pretty good. It says it's forever and ever and ever, and nothing can separate that love from me. Now, that's my depiction of Romans 8, 38. Can somebody help me? <laughs> I, I was preaching. I can't remember where I was at, Brenda. When I'm out there on the road, uh, I'm tame now compared to what I am out there because I can really be myself. And I let it, I cut it loose. You think I was Pentecostal. I had a president of one conference write me, are you Pentecostal? I said, yes, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. I, am, I have been doused. And one, <laughs> they'll either say, what are you on? I remember I was preaching the incredible grace of God one time, and it was in a big church up in St. Joseph, Missouri. You've been there, honey. And I screamed out, somebody help me. And one woman screamed out, you don't need any help. Well, I do. We have to have, still have to have the Holy Spirit, don't we? All right, it's going to be for, But when I start talking about God's love, I do get excited. Maybe I get over the top. I don't know. Anyway, let's go on a little bit further here. Now, we're talking about here, and I love this part right here, and we're going to get into that scripture very short. I've got a lot to say in a short time to say it. We do not receive the crumbs of God's love, but love fully intact, deep within the bosom of God. What are you talking about, Donnie? Well, if you ever go to Matthew 15, 22, here's what the Bible says. And behold, a woman of Canaan came unto Jesus Christ in the same coast that Jesus dwelt in. And she cried unto Jesus, O Jesus, O Lord, have mercy on me, thou son of David. Here's what she said. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Jesus didn't even look at her. 
He didn't answer. Finally, after four or five times, she kept saying, Oh, God, help me. Jesus, help me. He answered and said, I am not sent, lady, to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm here. He didn't. Now listen. I'm here to save the Jews who have lost their way. That's what he was telling this woman. Now listen to this. But he had a purpose in mind. He was saying to her, I am not come to save the Gentiles or the Canaanites. I come to save the Jewish nation. Don't pester me. That's how one writer put it. But she came and she worshipped him anyway. And he said to her, It is not right for me to take the Jewish bread, their salvation, and their message, and give it to the dogs. The disciples looked upon this Canaanite woman as if she was an animal. She was worthless. He was trying to teach them a lesson. Come on. He was saying what they thought to this woman. And here's what she said. You're right, Lord. I'm just a Canaanite. I'm just a sinner. I'm not part of the Jewish nation. Yet she said, even the dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Come on. She said, go God, I'll take the crumbs if you'll just answer my prayer today. But Jesus, in fact, was trying to teach His disciples a lesson. I come to give my life for all nations and all people, whether they're black or white, whether they're Jewish, whether they're Gentile. I come to give my life for all, and I come to feed anybody that wants to sit at my table. I don't want them to have their crumbs. I want them to have a full plate. Can somebody give me an amen on that? Listen to this. This woman, in the eyes of the Jews and the disciples, was considered no more than a, no more than a dog because her people worshipped idols. But Jesus had brought His disciples to this, listen, circumstance for a reason. It was time to break down the walls of the pride that the Jews had built and break down between the Gentiles and the Jews, break down that wall. Even though Jesus had purposely ignored the woman, she could still, and here's what I love, see, Bobby Joe, even though Jesus had ignored the woman, she could see the love and the compassion in the eyes of Jesus. That's why she kept going. And she said, even though I may be nothing more than a dog, Jesus, in the eyes of your people, even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table. Now listen to this. Up until this event, now this is when it all collapsed. Up until this event, the Jews were fed literally by the hand of God. The Lord was giving the Jews a last chance to return to Him. But they ignored the needs of the races of all people. They ignored taking the blessings of God and sharing their blessings. And because of that, that's why Peter went to the Gentiles. Can somebody give me that? He came to us to take the message of Jesus Christ to the world because the Jewish nation wasn't going to do that. Listen to this. The love that flows from the portals of heaven can overflow the plates and the cups at the divine table. No one, Jesus said, no one should be under the table. No one should have just have crumbs. Here's what it says in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. The Lord passed before Moses. And here's what he proclaimed. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving an iniquity and transgression and sin. The Word of God, listen, the Bible reveals God's character. He Himself declared His infinity of love and His pity. When Moses prayed and said, Show me thy glory, God said, I will make my goodness pass before thee. And the spirit of prophecy says God has bound our hearts to him by many tokens from heaven. He has sought to reveal himself to us. Here's what Mrs. White stated. True love is not merely a sentiment or emotion. It is a living principle. True love, wherever it exists, will control your life. Thus it is with the love of God. God is love, and in all His works, and in all His dealings with mankind, His loving character is constantly revealed. Oh, the cross, it is set up that we may know the only true God, and Jesus in whom He sent. Only the cross can measure the length, and the breadth, and the depth of God's infinite love. 
as Christ's arms were outstretched upon the cross. Now think about this. He was saying, I love you this much. Well, how much is this much? One hand faced to the east and one to the west. And the east and west go into what we call infinity. There is no end. <laughs> there is no end to God's love for you. You know, the God that's going to burn for you ever if you reject Him. Come on, somebody help me on that one. And I'm going to end on this. I have so much more to say. My, we may have a part two here if I'm not careful. In Genesis 22, 1, 2. And it came to pass after these things that God tempted Abraham. And he told Abraham, you're going to have a son. You all remember that? Came Isaac. And Abraham did have that son, even though Sarah was past having children. They had Isaac. Here's the bad news. And God said, now that you've got Isaac and you love him, you spent all this time with him, I want you to take your only son, whom thou lovest, into the land of Moriah, and I want you to build an altar, and I want you to sacrifice. I want you to kill your son as a sacrifice. It had been, the Bible says, 17 years since he had heard any voice from God. Then a revelation came to Abraham. It was a command given by God. And the heart of Abraham became grief-stricken and pained. He was overwhelmed because he was going to have to kill his only begotten son. Does that ring a bell? But the word here, tempt, means testing. God was testing Abraham. When God said, take your only son, God implied that Isaac alone was considered a legitimate sacrifice. You see where this is going, how symbolic that, that is? Pointing to Christ and God having to sacrifice his son. And here's what the spirit of prophecy says. Here we find a father who truly loved his son with all of his heart. The loss of Isaac, if it were by accident or disease, would have been heart-rendering to the fond father. But to have to kill him, a boy that was completely, totally innocent, was almost too overwhelming for Abraham. And here's what the Spirit of Prophecy says, and I believe it. The night before he took him to sacrifice him, Abraham went to the tent where his son lay sleeping. And Abraham, she said, looked upon the dear face of his son. And that Abraham turned away trembling. For the love of his son was great. And the thought of shedding innocent blood and the death of his beloved son was just too much to bear. God had to turn away from living at the cross. Is anybody with me? This God that was not able to look upon his son who died for you and then take the very ones that Jesus died for and burn them forever is totally ridiculous. I am, I am, what's the word? I'm hot under the collar, collar spiritually. I'm offended that anyone would talk about my God like that. God that sent His only begotten. No other being in the universe was worthy to die for mankind. It took an absolutely holy God that could bring me back to God, and that was the death of Jesus Christ. The very fact, can you imagine Jesus saying this to God? If it were true, CJ, that God sent you to eternal fire. I can just see Jesus looking at God and said, God, why did you send the ones to burn eternally in fire, the very ones that I loved and died for? Why did you do that? Come on, does that make sense to you today? It does to me. Perfect sense, CJ. I know. But you know what? The Bible says that God and Jesus think exactly alike. The Holy Spirit and God and Jesus think exactly alike. They all wanted this plan of salvation to take place. And they knew what it would take to take place. That was the death of a God, Jesus Christ, who is intensely in love with you. Heavenly Father, I pray that this message has wakened some eyes and some hearts and enlightened them. This is truth. This is what the Bible says. It's not what Pastor Donnie's come up with. This is what the Bible says. 
A God of gracious. A God of love. A God that's pure. A God that's all spirit. A God that's all holy. A God that's all patient and long-suffering, full of empathy and compassion and is intensely in love with each and every one of us. His desire is to bring us into the kingdom. And even though we may not make it to the kingdom and we're gone forever, the Bible says that God will love us anyway forever and ever and ever. That's the God that I serve today. I pray that someone was touched today and enlightened. I pray that someone has been brought back to you because this myth, this lie of a God that would burn you forever has been extinguished today, that lie. I thank you for this message. I thank you for the plan of salvation. God, continue to guide us here at this church. I pray that this church will grow. More folks will come in and give their lives to you. And we can take this message of thy love and thy grace and mercy and take it throughout the community and the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for this message, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.